What's up, golf fans? My name is Lucas Weiss, host of the Wee Sports Chronicles podcast. We got a great episode for you today, but first, some headlines as we enter day two of Masters Week. Sergio Garcia has tested positive for COVID-19, meaning that he will not be participating in this week's Masters. Garcia was the 2017 Masters champion, and it hasn't been playing great golf until 2020, where he won the Sanderson Farms Championship. Garcia's consecutive streak of majors played is now snapped at 84, and we wish him all the best in a speedy recovery due to COVID-19. We will miss him. Lee Elder is another big bit of big news that was made on Monday at Augusta National. Lee Elder, of course, is the first African-American golfer to play in the Masters Tournament all the way back in 1975. And chairman of Augusta National Golf Club, Frank Ridley, made the announcement on Monday that Lee Elder will be joining Jack Nicklaus and Gary Player on the first tee on Thursday to mark the ceremonial tee shot. And this is significant for a number of reasons, most notably because Elder broke the color barrier uh, at the Masters and to give him the respect that he deserves on this such important stage is really significant. Ridley also announced that Elder will be creating scholarships to provide kids the opportunity to play collegiate golf at some of the colleges in the local area near Augusta National. Another monumental moment, especially in terms of enhancing inclusivity, diversity, respect in the game of golf and and, and to get more people of color to play the game of golf. So Ridley definitely made reference to the protests surrounding anti-black racism as the reasons why this moment right now, why the conversation took place behind the scenes. So I really commend Augusta National for taking a step forward in using their voice and platform to give Lee Elder the respect he deserves. And finally, the Masters announced that for the 2020 Masters Tournament, The low 50 players and tides will qualify for the final 36 holes. So this is the first change to the cut since 2013. Now on to today's episode, episode 77, where I'm going to be interviewing Brendan Polrath. Brendan is the co-host of the Shotgun Start podcast. And you can find his work on a bunch of different media outlets. This week, Brendan will be covering the Masters from home for the New York Times. Brennan and I have a wide-ranging conversation about golf and social media, using your social media platform to galvanize a golf Twitter community. I know that Brennan's one of the leaders in doing that. Make sure to check out his Twitter. We also have a great conversation just about the 2020 Masters. Brendan's storylines to keep an eye on as, as we go throughout the week as well as Brendan's Champions Dinner Menu, if he had the chance to be uh, the menu decider for the night, and some of his favorite memories walking the historic grounds of Augusta National Golf Club. As always, the We Sports Chronicles podcast is available on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify, so make sure to like, rate, watch, and subscribe to all three of those channels. Now, without further ado, let's get to Episode 77 with Brendan Polrath on the We Sports Chronicles podcast. All right, as I said off the top, I'm pleased to be joined by Brendan Polrath. He is the co-host of the Shotgun Start podcast. You can find him on, at a bunch of different outlets as a golf journalist, freelance writer. Brendan, welcome to the We Sports Chronicles Masters-themed edition of the podcast. How are you? I'm well, I'm well. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate you having me on, Lucas. Appreciate it. Well, it's it's certainly my pleasure. And and and, and I gotta start with, with this question, Brendan, because of course the Masters were, were recording a week before the tournament happens in November, which is of course very on brand for 2020, a very unprecedented year. But you know, the Masters social media team has been posting these daily videos, whether it's getting the terrace already whether it's watching the paint dry on like the gate of, of, of Augusta National. What are your thoughts on those videos as someone who, who's, who's known to galvanize quite an audience on uh, social media? Uh, you know, I, 
I see the I see the debate happening. There seems to be a lot of discussion around them, whether they're good or they're self indulgent or they they're moving. Uh, I think I'm fine with them. You know, I think they hit on a theme that. Um, I, I, you know what? I see both perspectives. To be honest with you, I understand. I don't mean to dismiss those and think this is a little bit much, but uh, I think they hit on a theme that we are. Um, we should even the most mundane. We weren't sure what happened this year, and I think um, we are that the fact that we're getting these things, the ability to raise the flag on the founder circle or paint the curve green. I've sh- I remember I watched them paint like sewer covers one day. It's like people were trying to walk out our drainage pipes one morning uh, one afternoon before like i think it was last year wednesday night i was like gosh so it was unsurprising to see me paint in the curb but i think the theme of the videos i think what they're trying to get at is hey this may be some mundane task but we didn't think we we're going to be able to do it at all this year and whether that should share it publicly i understand the debate around it i'm happy i'm fine with it they're not exactly you know moving me to tears or anything like that <laughs> but um I, I don't. I don't have it in me to criticize them in the way that others do. Although I accept that viewpoint. So. <laughs> Fair enough. No, I mean, I I definitely agree. Like, I think you know, it, it may have been a bit over the top after maybe a few videos, but I think the first couple were like it, it, it got to the heart, man. It, it gave me all the feels. Right. Looking forward to uh, the Masters, which is really, a, as as CBS says, a tournament unlike no other. Right. We didn't think it was going to happen, or we didn't know it was going to happen, and it's happening in this. It, incredibly unique way in November. Uh, so, hey, here are some very simple, you know, scenes and sights from the Masters, and it's a way to appreciate that it's happening at all. Uh, but I do like those. I, I am finding great amusement out of those poking fun with it. I think some a Twitter user, you know, dubbed the music over, like, cleaning his toilet <laughs> at home. And stuff. So, like, that's fun. I, I don't mind that, too, at all. But uh, I think that the whole theme for me of this Masters is, like, um, enjoying the unique, uh, not enjoy, but appreciating the uniqueness of this opportunity at all. It's been a horrible year. It's mm-hmm. been a challenging year. And that's not to say, you know, this was worth it because we get this November Masters at all, but just understanding the opportunities born out of bad situations, right? Like we would never have a November Masters. We'd never have a college game day for the American <laughs> audience at, at the Masters. We would never, you know, it's just different, different way to consume the Masters. And trying to appreciate that unique chance from uh, born out of a bad situation. So I got to be honest with you. When I heard that ESPN college game day was going to be at Augusta national, I almost, you know, fell off my chair because Augusta national allowing college game day on its sacred premises. Does it feel a little, uh, I mean, off brand for Augusta, but Hey, it's 2020 and uh, they're doing this great cross promotional, uh, approach to to get more fans uh involved with college football as well as golf yeah no so this is another thing i've really wrestled with gone back and forth like is this really off brand for augusta Mm. or is this actually who they've been so so there's a couple of different timelines in augusta's history like Mm. the first 30 40 years of the masters tournament and this is you know as far as majors go the masters is a giant come lately it's the youngest Mm. it's you know it's not that old compared to the national opens um, which have been, you know, the British Open's been around for 150 years. Mm-hmm. Um, but the Masters, for a long time, would engage in this kind of cross promotion. Would engage in this kind of pushing of it, it broadening technology. Would engage in like the Par Three contest and some of these other games and stuff. That they they create. They wanted like other side contests around just the tournament. You know, Bobby Jones thought the tournament should be only 54 holes, maybe, or and mm-hmm. they need to have long drive contests to get more fans like and, and Clifford Roberts was like really aggressive and pushing for color TV and pushing for greater broadcast enhancements and then they became this powerhouse brand right and then in the middle it shifted somewhere to like no you we won't even let you look at our front nine right mm-hmm. you're not allowed to, so it became much more of a closed off a little bit of, of not necessarily pushing those boundaries trying to expand their reach or broaden their horizons with a cross activation like this. So I can't decide. I wrestle with back and forth. Like it's not, it might be surprising to maybe like the 2000 masters fan, but th- this is a bit in their roots mm. kind of reaching across different sort of sports audiences and different um, ways to promote the masters 
Um, it, it, it is in their roots, so you just got to go a ways back. And it's probably shocking to some of us who are used to, some of us in the more recent generation who are used to them, you know, trying to maybe even limit limit outside voices or limit coverage. And, and with, it is a little shocking. I think it's cool. It's fun. But there is a little bit of this in, in the tournament's roots, in the club's roots. Well, this is why I have you on the podcast, Brennan. Not you know, not just for your golf knowledge, but this wealth of history. So I so I greatly appreciate that uh, that perspective, and I'm sure my listeners will as well. Listener, so are you going to the Masters? Or are you going to be covering it from home this year? Covering it from home, not going to the Masters. You know, I I I left my full time writing gig in the third filed and then june i guess it was mm. uh, i'll be covering it on the podcast i think i'm going to be doing a little writing for the new york times from Great. far um but no we'll not be there it sounds quite onerous you know it, it, it says rightfully so mm-hmm. in terms of the testing and getting everybody in and got kids at home just not going to go this year ideally i'll be back next april uh but I, i'm anxious to see how it all looks and who for, for everyone that is there so what's the challenge of that, Brennan? Because I know that this year, many members of golf media that may- maybe don't live in the States, who, who couldn't travel. I-, I know certain members of the Canadian golf media had to cover majors from home. Sure. What, what challenge does that present just from a storytelling and reporting perspective? Um, I don't know. It's, it's presents challenges and benefits, quite mm. honestly. Um, you know, the, at, at the Masters... So I love to write kind of the scene piece and, and understand, like, be out there and, and maybe pick up on a thing that's not going to be on the broadcast, There's and there's plenty of it there. But also at the Masters, you are really siloed off. You can't take your phone out there. <laughs> Even the writers, nobody's taking a phone out there. There aren't any TV boards. They have the old school boards. So you are really siloed off uh, from kind of understanding the larger picture of what's happening in the tournament. It's like the hole you're watching, and you're monitoring the manual leaderboard. Um, so there, there, there are benefits to being there on the ground and observations you certainly pick up, but I, I mean, I think it's often easier to cover and understand the full scope of the tournament watching at home on mm-hmm. TV or watching in the media center. And, you know, that may be a dirty little secret to a lot of guys who are trying to, you know, blow through their company's expense accounts and travel <laughs> all over to these tournaments. But, um, it really depends on what kind of story you're trying to write and what kind of coverage you're trying to provide. But I, I don't know. There are certain challenges, but I think there's also a, a great benefit to being able to watch it with your computer. Why the broadcast does an awesome job nowadays. Mm-hmm. Like you they cover every hole. Sounds like the tournament, uh, the masters is going to have this feature where you can follow your own group, basically mm-hmm. every shot, you know, the, all the technology is sort of in place to really have a, a you know, as long as you you have that, background knowledge of Augusta National and the Masters, like being able to consume it all from afar isn't that detrimental. Now, if you're trying to write a certain piece about Augusta or how something's playing in the crowd, yeah, that's going to be a challenge, but there is no crowd this year. So um, I I don't think, I'm not too concerned about being able to cover it authoritatively or, or comprehensively from home. And I think the way in which golf content is produced and delivered has changed too. I mean, I think like 20, 30 years ago, being there, I think almost was vital just because, you know, it was majority print and and TV and things Mm -hmm. like that. Whereas now, being from home, like you could do the podcast, which you're doing. You could do the social media because, as you say, the broadcast is so, you know, high level and so thorough and good that you know being there isn't necessarily mandatory in order to produce some really compelling and engaging golf content yeah i mean i've written some of my best things from covering a major from my couch Mm -hmm. Uh, or you know not not that they're good but my own personal (laughs) opinion subjective opinion like better than all my bad stuff you know i'm not suggesting it's good for the rest of our lives my own personal feelings i'm sure it's good Uh, brendan i'm sure it was good (laughs) <laughs> no, but I just don't know that that's like a, an essential part of being able to write or capture or tell a story. Um, it, it can, it, this is not to suggest it, it's not preferred because it is, you can tell you the best story, the, the best writing uh, often come from being on the ground or getting little snippets or being able to report there. Like that, that's probably the best storytelling. But I, I think you can write some really great stuff from your couch and, and getting a full, holistic, thousand-foot view of the tournament and what happened watching from home. 
I want to follow up on that because I find that like really interesting. So like what makes you then be a better writer from writing on your couch? Is it, is it like the fact that it's your couch? Is it the fact that you're just comfortable at home? You get those vibes. I mean, what, what is it about that for you? Uh, I think sometimes it's just, uh, yeah, there's some comfort there. Uh, so, uh, sometimes it's just like the way you consume the tournament uh, is, can be, uh, like I said, a more, more holistic, right? Mm-hmm. Um, You've got your Twitter open. You you can pick and choose what stats or what what points you are sticking with you, or what, frame your own kind of thoughts on what's happening. There's just more information at your disposal. Maybe um, there's not that observational stuff of walking with the players or walking with the leaders or with the f- patrons. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's more about just like an informational thing. Like I, I feel like I have a firm grasp on what happened, how it happened, why it happened. Now let me put my own perspective on. on coming out of my working knowledge of that player or that player's background or the tournament's background or the tournament's history at that spot and, and then apply it to the story that I watched and consumed uh, from afar. Uh, so it goes both ways. Obviously, I, I think like you can tell some amazing stories being there on the ground and, and that's preferred. Like, again, that's preferred, but I don't think it's impossible to write some really good thousand words on uh, something that you, uh, per, your perspective on, on a Sunday night after watching four days from home. We'll get into some of the storylines on the golf course heading into the Masters, but in terms of just whether it's something that's non-golf related or broadcast related, what are you what are you most looking forward to about uh, the 2020 Masters, especially in this unique time slot that is November? Oh, uh, there's so much. I mean. Uh, it's hard to say like I'm, I'm fascinated to see how the course plays I, I don't think it'll be too different I think it'll look green I think the greens will be fast um, I, I'm fascinated by the whole how we consume this right is it gonna be um, you know there's split teas starting in the morning everything's gonna be done earlier because of darkness of course we got a little appetizer of that last year on Sunday when they moved tea times up which is extremely rare um, and finished whatever it was three o'clock Easter so there's just I, I think it's the whole package of this incredibly unique experience with no patrons uh I, i'm interested to see how cold it is in the morning the ball might not be going that far uh justin thomas talked about that at san francisco at the pga because you know san francisco doesn't get particularly warm in august um and how he was losing speed like that could be not an issue but something that these players are adjusting to will will the bigger hitters have even a greater advantage because um the cold temperatures are, are limiting how far the ball is flying. It doesn't look like it's going to be frigid, um, but but in the morning it's not going to be it's not going to be that warm, and it's not necessarily piping hot in April either. That's the <laughs> other misconception that it's going to be so much colder than it is in April. April is pretty moderate in and of itself. So there's so many things. I I, I guess I'm just so I don't know that there's one specific thing I'm looking forward to. It's more of like this this entire package of this incredibly wild, unique circumstances of watching the masters in November with, you know, football going on around it and after it and, and, you know, tee times off number 10, you know, number 10, you know, they switched the routing at Augusta. I don't know if you know this because, you know, 12 was the last hole to thaw. The frost went late because it's so it's far deep down in the far corner of the course and it's covered in trees. So it doesn't get a lot of sunlight. So that used to be the third hole, mm-hmm. right? But, you know, they'd have frost delays. So they decided, hey, let's flip it. Let's make it the, the 12th instead of the third, and the frost will be gone by the time the players are there. So that's kind of like a unique piece of history that all this – now we got guys going off 1 and 10, which understandably for time constraints and daylight constraints, you know, is there going to be a frost delay? I don't think so, but it's fascinating to watch the course. Some of them play the course, you know, as, as it was originally – laid out way back in the 30s so no that's some great perspective and i think it's just a potpourri of things just to see and like i understand that we've seen the pga without spectators we've seen the u.s open without spectators but this is the masters where the patrons really have an impact like you can you know play on 13 and hear them all the way throughout the course known as the augusta roars and not having that will certainly be a bit of an you know feel a little strange but it is 2020 after all but I wanted to go a little bit further on that whole no spectators because 
We've had a couple majors, Colin Morikawa winning the PGA, Bryson DeChambeau winning the US Open, and I can't help but think though, Brendan, if there were fans there, how they would have impacted, how the rest of the field would have impacted since these are both first-time winners. I'm just curious for you, like, do you think that has an impact? Do you think that it advantages guys that if there were crowds there they would maybe crumble under that pressure of a situation what are your thoughts on that yeah i think it has an impact for sure mm -hmm. uh, i was i was hesitant to adopt that position uh early on mm -hmm. like, oh, the best players and the guys who hit it the best you know um they win anyways whether there's player uh, fans outside the ropes or not but I think we have some testimony now from this. I think it's hurting the very best in the world. They're the most popular players in the world. I think they're used to playing with crowds. They're used to the the impact that crowds have around them, not only on them, but their competitors who maybe aren't as popular or maybe not used to the large followings. Uh, Tiger has said this. Mm -hmm. Roy McIlroy has said there's an emotional impact on it. It's harder for him to get up, it feels like, to get fired up. He's used to playing in front of large crowds. Tiger knows how to play with thousands of people running around and and maybe the noise is, you know, blocking out all the noise around him that might impact his competitors. You know, uh, last year, you know, there's this, this, you know, spectator code or guide or whatever it is at Augusta National, and you're not, you're not to cheer, absolutely not cheer bad shots. There were cheers. I was down there when Francesco Molinari's ball went in the water on 12. Um, now, you know, does, does that impact Francesco? I don't know. He was, he, seem to be hanging on by for dear life all, all day but the, the the sort of scurrying around him you know helps tiger it helps mm -hmm. tiger i do think having no fans sort of why it closes the gap between the best in the world or the most popular players and those who aren't there's just less intimidation less to take on less you know we saw this at the u.s open even at wingfoot I think Bryson would have been heckled a fair amount, not not heckled, but 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 poked quite a mm -hmm. bit by some large New York crowd. Um, he played so well, it probably wouldn't have stopped him from winning, but it might have been a little more dramatic or tighter if that crowd was very very clearly behind Matthew Wolf or very, you know, shouting things that that you know maybe threw Bryson off his concentration here or there. Um, so I I do think like it has an impact. Uh, it's it's not. It's, not, it's impossible to quantify. Tiger, I think, tried to quantify it, saying half a shot or something like that along the lines this summer. Um, but but it does have an impact and probably hurts the most popular player, somebody like Tiger or Rory. Well, you look at last year's Masters, and of course, it's one of the most historical events, not just in golf, but in all of sports. If Tiger wins and there's no crowd cheers on the 18th, it's just, you know, a little shoulder tap and you know hug it just we just wouldn't have the same impact like i just don't think you know that sure. moment of him with his family and just the, the whole cheering i don't know if it has that same impact so it's just gonna feel a little strange just seeing like just no one around and just few applauses on the 18th when we have a, a masters winner in 2020 yeah absolutely it'll feel it'll feel different Different all the way. It, it'll feel different all the way from the start to finish. It's already feels different because it's November, you know, mid-November when they're teeing off. So, but but I think the other thing is again that, that's balancing with, with no masters at all. You mm -hmm. know, the different masters is better than no masters at all. And you know, there may not be that roar or that crescendo on 18, but there will be a winner, and, and that's kind of what I'm taking from this. So. You've covered many majors and you obviously have a process in terms of how you, you know, you, you approach the majors. From a social media though perspective, Brendan, I mean, are you thinking a few days or, or weeks in advance of I me mean, like what's gonna be creative, what's gonna be good, or is it just sort of like a daily thing pops in your mind that's funny and boom, I'm gonna tweet it out there and get uh hundreds of likes and retweets what's the without re revealing all the state secrets what's the what's the approach i think you're giving me more credit than i than i <laughs> really ever deserve at all uh no i think it's usually just just sort of seat of my pants there's very little planning that goes into but i may be thinking about storylines or maybe thinking about uh ironies or amusements or inanities that that at a, ahead of time but there are no real planned tweets or 
planned approach is it's usually what we're given and reacting to it and making a joke or making a, an observation if you can. There's very little there's very little planning that goes into it. Uh, it's more about being present, seeing what's happening, seeing what's amusing, seeing what's a, a potential story and letting it rip. Um, so that's it. There's no, there's not a lot of planning. It, it's just being present. Of course, you know, at the masters, when you're at the masters, you're kind of silent. You go dark cause you go out on the course for five, six hours at a time and you don't have your phone and you get back into whatever's there for you. So it's a little different this year uh, being at home. So I, I kind of actually look forward to it, but there's no, no grand social media strategy or plan. I'll leave that for the big brands that have, you know, <laughs> voices they need to worry about. But I feel like golf, though, just in general, the sport, though, Brendan, has grown tremendously in that social media podcast space. I mean, you look at your podcast, you look at No Laying Up, and it's just very interesting to me to just to see how a sport that sometimes gives off this sort of older, stuffier perception can all can be willing to then grow and evolve and adapt to the 21st century methods of producing and delivering content. And I, and I find it very refreshing for the sport of golf that we're sort of getting more personalities from golfers on social media. We're getting more people like yourself using social media as that space to produce com- content compared to sort of the traditional ways of journalism. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I think golf still lags significantly behind, and there's a vacuum there. You know, I've been saying this for a long time, but um, yeah, I, I think it was natural uh, evolution and transition. I, I think like the stories are still the stories, and whether they're told via, you know, podcast or via tweet thread or via printed word, I, I think like quality is still quality, and voice is still voice, and I, I think we kind of get worked up a little bit. To, too much in the medium to be honest with you I, I think like we chase this you know we're going to expand the audience because we're on tiktok and this that and the other and it's not it's just about telling really good stories or valuable information or amusing information or entertaining so entertaining and uh, you know anecdotes to the core audience and i think sometimes chasing this uh casual fan has gotten us in trouble and the core audience is maybe they're they want hardcore, they want golf stuff, whether you give it to them in a podcast or you give it to them in a awesome, like magazine feature, like I, I, like talent is talent. And I don't think it should be, I don't think we should portray this as some like old versus new Mm. battle. It's just like where people are consuming things is on the internet and where, you know, if they want to consume it audio or consume it, you know, be a written word that, I think it's all good. It's it's more about having quality and having real real voice um, and authenticity to whatever you're saying or communicating or producing. Um, but yeah, I, I think like we stray a little bit too far from from not from talking about actual golf, and that's where people get in trouble. That they they pursue this like millennial audience. We got to capture millennial. Well, no, you don't. Like you just need to tell like good stuff, and maybe it's being told in a podcast as opposed to. Um, like a, a, a newspaper article, but I think there's there's room for everybody, uh, and, and I think just focusing on really the, the the core golf audience, getting them in the boat to tell their friends who aren't necessarily that core audience, it should be the priority. How long did it take you to to find and cultivate that that golf audience when you were first starting out as a freelance writer and then a podcaster? How long? Yeah, like how long did it take like that learning curve? I mean, like for anyone that's starting out as, you know, podcasting, there's a bit of a learning curve for, for someone that maybe not as well known to then get, you know, curate and cultivate that audience so that you can then get more listeners, get more downloads, etc. Yeah, no, I mean, on the podcast side, we've done it for almost, I don't know, two and a half years now. And, um, I think my co-host Andy Johnson and I, mm-hmm. we both came to it with our sort of own audiences already built in from writing and doing other things before that. Um, I, I don't know. It, it, it takes a while. I'm sure to feel comfortable and to feel like you have a voice. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think like the primary thing is, is, is being authentic with that voice and not chasing, you know, uh, a certain number of clicks not letting sort of the tail wag the dog right mm-hmm. um 
chasing a certain number of clicks or chasing some advertising dollars or chasing whatever it is or trying to appease the necessary tour, uh, the, the tour or some other partner that impacts the actual value of the story and the voice of the story. Um, you know, it takes, it takes forever. You need reps, right? You need to feel comfortable. It's hard to like, it's hard to quantify that or make it tangible. Like I wrote 250 stories and now I feel like I have my voice mm -hmm. and footing. No, it's, it's like, it's hard to say how you gather or acquire that expertise or comfortableness. And I'm not suggesting I have it. Um, but like after a certain while, you just feel comfortable and confident in the way that you know what you're talking about, or you know how you want to talk about things. And, you know, it, it takes a ton of reps. I, I wrote a lot of mundane stuff, like a lot of just really basic stuff that I would start to interject my own voice with, right? Whether it's, you know, here are the tea times for Thursday at the masters well you know i'm gonna play around and have fun with this i'm gonna give you that information but play around and have a lot of fun and put my voice in front of it and so like you know it just it, it's very basic you need to like work your butt off like work really really hard doing the mundane things while also developing that voice and, and experimenting until you feel like you're really comfortable no i think that's a really candid response i think the whole idea of reps have had several sports media guests on this podcast and i just think that that's a common theme is the more you get the reps the more you'll feel comfortable and even those that are experienced like i had alan shipnuck who i'm sure you know on, on on the pod and he's someone that is still you know evolving and you know trying to you know you know continue to write yeah. and do some great stuff so it's you know you, you need to just continue to evolve and have that process and and tinker with your with your overall what you're going to be doing in order to find something that really appeals to that audience. And I think golf is a great space that it, that's allowed voices like yourself and many others to, to, to grow and, and to produce some compelling content. Yep. Yeah. It, it's, it, there's, it's felt like there's less like institutional barriers and in mm -hmm. golf, to be honest with you. And there may be some consolidation and contraction going on these days, but uh, like it felt like there was such much more of a uh, opening there in golf for sure. Who's a golfer that's flying under the radar for you this week for the masters that many people may not be thinking about, but could really surprise and potentially win. That's a good question. I don't know. I got to dive into my analysis here. Under the, I'm horrible. I'm horrible at handicapping. <laughs> horrible at picking. Uh, you know, under the radar. I, I don't know. My, my co-host is going to love this. I I love Lee Westwood just because oh, I seem to like, forget about him. Got to love Lee. You know, he's, he always gets really high odds. You know, it's like, uh, you know, 100 to 1, 80 to 1, things like that. But he's like. Every time he comes to Augusta, and it's been a couple of years now, he's like automatic, you know, he knows how to play it. And that, that matters more at this major than I think most of them, right? We've seen like that experience thing, you know, usually that's a really overhyped sort of cliche and talking point, but it does really matter at Augusta National where understanding every single green or understanding how the course is going to play in different conditions matters. And we, that's, a, there's a reason why we haven't seen a first time winner since 1979. And Lee Westwood obviously has that. Um, Bubba Watson seems to be a very trendy pick again, mm -hmm. you know, the lefty thing uh, where he can sort of bomb it and cut it for him, uh, around a lot of these corners, the right to left ball flight. Um, but, but he has not been, you know, this is sort of one of his happy hunting grounds, right? This Riviera, he shows up and and he's it, he has like almost built an advantage because of because uh, of the course. He's another one I think that's under the radar, become a little more trendy lately. But I like him as well. Um, everybody's going to talk about Bryson. I think it's just finding the people who are not Bryson. Obviously, <laughs> Tiger, Tiger. There's not much to go off this year. I'm not expecting much, but I didn't expect much last last year, and he won it. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. That, under the radar it's hard it's such a limited field i think we get sort of lost in the term dark horse or sleeper like what does that even mean there's only like 85 players and half of them are not half but a lot of them are amateurs or past winners with no chance so like there, there's there's no the dark horse set is much more much smaller at a place like the masters 
No, for sure. I mean, for me, what I'm really interested in seeing what uh, Brooks Kepka does because, of course, the last uh-huh. major that he played was the PGA, and there was that whole, you know, banter with DJ and things like that. And, and of course, Brooks hasn't had his best year because of mainly injuries, but this is someone that's delivered at majors the last few years and just seems to show up at them and, and be in the mix. Yeah, I don't know what ex- what to expect totally from Brooks, right? I think the injuries really made an imp- played an impact uh, on his season. That's that's kind of undeniable. Uh, but he's also someone that's proven like he can kind of just show up at, at the majors. Are a different calculation and a different mental approach for him, and he feels comfortable and confident that his his competitors by and large are going to crumble. We've seen him do that math. He's like, well, there's like six guys I got to beat. I start calculating at a U.S. Open could take out you know 75 percent of the field right away at the start of the week so he has like this real confident approach and i don't know the the the, the i don't know if the worm has turned a bit or what's going on based on the injury he's been sort of underwhelming this year uh he seems consumed not consumed but certainly impacted by the what bryson's doing in the chase he does not like bryson at all <laughs> i think that's fairly obvious um you know whether that's impacting his play on the course that's unlikely but uh, I think coming back to Augusta, look, we gave him a little bit of a pass last year. He didn't, he didn't, he wasn't this majors closer at the Masters. You know, mm-hmm. he gets that rep and, you know, he's deservedly so. He won four really fast. But, you know, a lot of the heat went to Molinari because he had those sort of fantastic explosions, putting the ball in the water 15, of course, the one at 12. Um, but Brooks really didn't distinguish himself down the stretch last year either. So I, uh, that he was in the hunt, I think is, is sort of a harbinger for things that he will have a long and successful career at the, at Augusta national. Uh, I think his game fits there as it does almost every major. Hmm. Uh, but I don't know that he's a favorite, like he has been in past years or past majors, just because of this, this whole injury thing seems to be a real real nagging issue where he's talked about never being hundred percent again before it also it's like a week to week deal. I've never felt this good or I'll never be hundred percent. I just don't have a ton of confidence in his health. All right. I got a couple rapid fire questions. Then I'll ask you my okay. fi- my final question. Um, go to master's food when you're there. Oh, uh, when I'm there, I'm a big biscuit. Okay. I make the best biscuits. I'm not. A, I'm a Yankee. I'm not from the South, but uh, they've got the sausage or chicken biscuit. It doesn't matter to me in the morning. That are just I could eat those for breakfast, lunch. I usually probably uh, I'll probably go chicken. Okay. Chicken biscuit sandwich is the best. And building off of food, if you were to create the Masters Champions dinner menu, what would be on it? Um. Uh, I'd probably go pretty basic. I'm, you know, like I said, a Midwestern corn-fed Midwesterner. I'd probably do really nice steak, maybe a little turf, surf and turf. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, surf and turf, but definitely steak, a nice potatoes dish. Like it would be steak and potatoes. I know that a good red <laughs> wine. Nice. Uh, pretty basic stuff. Nothing like super eccentric or international because hey i'm a pretty simple midwesterner <laughs> no barbecue in there brendan no barbecue uh i don't think so i don't okay. think so no no I, I i think we'll do a steak uh maybe a little bit of lobster and nice. potatoes like very basic grill with some asparagus that of course they have, they'll have a lot of butter and salt on it brussels sprouts maybe with similar butter and salt quantities but yeah kind of kind of your midwestern simple simpleton and finally, you've you've covered several masters. What's the craziest story or interaction that you've had with a player while you've been covering the tournament? Oh, that's a good one. Um, craziest story or interaction with a player? Or just in general. Like just in general that was like just yeah. one for one for the books. Yeah, there's so many things. Oh gosh. I mean, an incredible memory of mine is being at 16 when Spieth made that putt to mm. look like he was going to shoot 62 and he was chasing Reed. Like, 
I think that's the loudest I've ever heard a golf course. I was with a friend, uh, Kyle Porter of CBS yep. and Van Valkenburg of ESPN. And like, we were joking and laughing as friends and that like, just kind of make a, you know, having chat conversation. And then all of a sudden that happened. Like, I remember distinctly like that whole, that whole Sunday was like Reed versus Roy, right? In the yep. final group. And we like peeled off them at seven. Cause like, Spieth was doing things, you know, we <laughs> peeled off to like 11 or 12 down to Amen Corner and then like it really crescendoed at 16. That roar, it's not the biggest thing, right? I've, I was like, talk about being the tiger as he's yeah. running through that. I was around the clubhouse last year as he ran through that kind of human tunnel. The thing about the Masters is you're not, you never get like really up close with the players, right? They mm -hmm. kind of, you can't get on the range or anything like that. But um, I think that putt at 16 for speed was the loudest I've ever heard a golf course or will ever hear a golf course. And it's maybe a little bit forgotten at this point because it, it wasn't, you know, like a signature winning shot, but uh, that's a cool, cool memory. I'll kind of always take with me. Brennan Porath is a golf journalist. He's the co-host of the shotgun start podcast. Brendan, enjoy the masters from your couch. And uh, thanks so much for coming on. This Masters themed edition of the Wii Sports Chronicles. Thanks so much for having me. Really appreciate it.